Welcome to Growing E-Commerce. I'm your host, Mike Ryan of Smarter E-Commerce, also known as Mech. Today, I'm joined by Stefan Wenzel. He is co-CEO of On Quality Group, which connects brands with marketplaces. And his resume includes managing director at eBay Germany, managing director at Otto Netherlands. By the way, Otto Group clears 16 billion euros in revenue across 100 companies worldwide. And he ran e-commerce and direct-to-consumer at the legendary racing and automotive manufacturer, McLaren. We talk about all that. But today, for better or worse, we take specific aim at Timu and Shein. These companies are, if I may say so, loud but mysterious. So if you want to understand what's really going on at Shein and Timu, how they really operate, keep listening. We discuss their acquisition models, their logistics, and the user experience. And I learned a ton from Stefan. Remember, if you enjoy this podcast, please leave a review and share it with a friend, a coworker, or on social media. We really appreciate it. All right, there's a lot here. Let's get into it. So Stefan, thanks so much for joining me this morning. Thanks for the invite, Mike. Nice. Absolutely. Why, why don't you get us started here? Tell us about yourself. What are, what are your skills? What themes interest you? Sure. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, in the digital commerce space for literally 25 years, which means I, at least from a German perspective, started uh, pretty much straight from the get-go. So overall, seasoned general manager, if you will, in, in digital and, and commerce. Before I, I joined the digital space, I, I've been with the German Air Force for eight years. I've been an officer at the Air Force, which is, which is an interesting start. But then ever since digital and commerce is the field and, and always with, you know, pretty broad end to end scope, but, but nevertheless, with a passion for go to market. So front of the house is where, where my main passion is, but I've always been responsible for, for end to end e-commerce and slash multi-channel, omni-channel businesses. Yeah, I mean, there's just kind of a really, really impressive list of companies on your resume. You've been at McLaren, Auto, eBay, Tom Taylor. And by the way, st hold on real quick. What was your role at eBay again, by the way? I started to be responsible for the fashion vertical on, on for eBay Germany, coupled with being the managing director of Brands for Friends which back then was Germany's largest flash sales shopping club company, which eBay acquired. And then my, my role was to run this as an MD, but also look after the fashion vertical on eBay.de and seek synergies between the two businesses. And then afterwards, I was asked to uh, lead the entire German business, so VP Germany. Okay. And I just think it's such an interesting blend here because, you know, McLaren, I'd love to hear what exactly was going on there. I think it was more on the merchandising side, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, did, then, I, I didn't fit the car. I didn't fit in the car. So. <laughs> and, and Otto, let me just frame that quick for, for some of our internet because in, in Germany, it needs no introduction, but I don't know. I think a fair kind of shortcut, mental shortcut to this for people would be to call it the Amazon of, of Germany. Maybe, hold on, now, okay, now I want to hear your take on that because I see you smiling. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure the, the communications department loves to hear that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Otto, the Otto Group is, is, a, is a huge retail and services and even finance company. I mean, own logistics solution, own, you know, financing and, and debt collecting activities, but also you know, omni-channel, multi-channel retail, powerhouse, if you will, total of, I don't know, what is it, 20 odd companies mm -hmm. spread around the globe, uh, a lot of retail brands, you know, Crate and Barrel, Freemans. I mean, they, they, are, they are companies, part of the group that, you know, that are not, you know, visibly associated, but it's, it's, a, it's a huge group of, of, you know, companies within the tip, I mean, historically from the mail order distance selling space but grew into being obviously focusing on e-commerce slash multi-channel, omni-channel, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, here you just describe it like that. I think the mental shortcut is a bit, is a bit lazy. So I'll side with Otto's comms department on this one. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think there are quite a few, quite a few businesses in Germany that grew out of that mail order branch into e-commerce. I think, I think that was like a, a, a path for a few, a few of these large companies. 
Yeah. yeah, I mean, Germany was was historically a very strong mail order. I mean, back into the 18th some, something, yeah. I mean, 1800 something, the first mail order catalog was launched down here. I mean, it's what we liked at least for, you know, a long period of time. And of course, some said or think that mail order is somewhat, you know, kind of a groundwork that was easy to apply to e-commerce, which in fact is not true. I mean, there are similarities because you ship parcels, but that's about it. Everything before the parcel goes out of the warehouse, I think there is a huge difference. And that's why Otto is more or less the only incumbent uh, of that mail order era, at least in, in Germany, that made it through. I mean, all others went bust, were removed from the market because they just didn't manage the transition. Because e-commerce, in fact, is a lot different to what the, you know, paper-based uh, mail order colleagues uh, actually did. But yeah, they seem to manage, have managed the transition. And, and Otto.de, which is, you know, just one brand out of the Otto groups, you know, uh, group of companies, Otto.de is the number three, I think, in the German market uh, with regards to their marketplaces business. They even yeah. evolved from a retail concept into being a marketplace, which most of the large ones did or are doing. And they, I think, are now number three marketplace in, in, in Germany behind yeah. Amazon uh, and eBay. Yeah, and maybe maybe it's that kind of marketplace side that gets, I don't know, for what just marketplaces are so in right now. But yeah, so that's yeah. quite interesting because you've got the, that retail marketplace side, then that consumer to consumer marketplace with eBay and a couple of brands. So maybe you could just walk us through some some highlights and lowlights from from that career. I mean, when I joined the e-commerce space in 1999, I mean, everything was was new to most of, you know, the, the players. And back then I had the first, you know, assignment, which was which was way larger than I, I should have taken. I mean, I was literally well punching above my weight and I was assigned to to kick off, launch and scale the direct to consumer e-commerce channel for a fashion brand called Max M E X X. And I mean, if you have a chance, you know, young at young, young at age to be responsible for the introduction of such a complete new business model within an existing brand. I mean, that was Max back then was kind of a second, you know, to to Esprit fashion. So mid market, mid segment, you know, fashion brand, double digit growth. I mean, in the heydays, I think it was close to a billion in in top line. So it was substantial for you know for a, a single brand, mono label brand, if you will. And 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 to be asked to to set something like this up at a point in time where this was really innovative or new to everyone. I mean it was great. And this was where basically you started to to learn, you know, it the hard way and and you know by by just you know running into you know real life experience. No theory involved. Zero customers, bring your own pen. And we kicked this off out of a, an offsite, you know, office here in Hamburg. Later on, migrated the team to the headquarters in Amsterdam. Grew responsibility to be, you know, head of, you know, all home shopping, D 2 C, B 2 B across Europe. It's great. Moved on to McLaren. I mean, what a prime brand! What an experience to be asked to to build up and scale their D 2 C merchandise business. I had the pleasure to kick off the Lewis Hamilton fan club. I mean, I joined in winter 2006. It was prior to his very first season. We had lunch together. He was the apprentice. And a couple of months later, he was kicking kicking the back of then reigning world champion Fernando Alonso. I mean, it was all blood, sweat, tears, the magic. I mean, and to be to in, in that, you know, I mean, to be asked to do something like this in, in such a period of time for McLaren, where they were really gaining momentum and we were able to leverage this whole let's say drive then commercially i mean fantastic fantastic i had no interest uh, in formula one i'm not a petrol head by any stretch but brand is kind of always what what intrigued me i mean i'm a label kid myself i i loved brands i mean since i mean for as much for as long as i can think i was always fascinated by brands loved to engage with brands and and I mean that started to be a, somewhat a golden thread in in my career and McLaren definitely a showcase for an ever evolving brand because imagine they're changing title sponsors every other year and then the brand somewhat changes entirely but not fully 
It's like, I mean, to see this unfold back then with the title sponsor being Vodafone, they just came out of the West cigarettes era and moved into Vodafone. I mean, from silver, black, you know, into a Vodafone bright orange, you know, I mean, to see the transformation of a brand and then see it kick in also commercially being applied and then leveraged is is always fascinating. And the last example in terms of, you know, intriguing experiences or great experiences, in fact, was uh, with, with the Otto Group, uh, a small subsidiary in the Netherlands, you know, struggling in the transition from mail order to e-commerce. So I got, asked, I mean, they asked me whether, you know, um, I would be willing to help to turn this around. And and of course, very difficult. I mean, culturally difficult from catalog to, to pure online, commercially difficult. I mean, Otto as a brand in the Netherlands. I mean, even the name is a, is, is a challenge, right? And the image of Germans outside Germany isn't the strongest, as you may imagine. So, I mean, you know, a lot of good reasons why that wasn't, wasn't a walk in the park. But we managed to do that and, and just change the way, you know, the, the company went to market, the way we operated the business, the way we, you know, added traction, a small subsidiary in, in the, you know, in, in offside somewhere in the Netherlands with a strong headquarters in Hamburg. I mean, all that also political stuff we, we managed to, to work through and, and get more traction. I mean, looking back, this is all great. But every assignment had, of course, great learnings and, and, and upsides in it, but not only upsides. I mean, obviously, it's always a bag full of challenges that comes with it as well. Yeah. I mean, thanks for sharing those stories. I love hearing about these this kind of brand evolution at McLaren and because, yeah, you know, you're just in the end, it's I don't want to say tinkering with the brand, but it, it introduces this this kind of friction and maybe a burden to the mental availability that a brand should kind of have. And then that recognition, I just, you know, I thought I was someone who was, who is more on the brand agnostic side. That's what I thought. And then when I moved here to Europe, I realized that that wasn't true at all because I suddenly felt like, like a cat without whiskers or something. Like I had this sixth sense that I wasn't aware of. You have this whole mental vocabulary of brands and you know, it was hard for me to go and, and buy products. And I just, I just was missing this whole frame of reference. And I gained a lot of respect for the, the power and importance of brands when I moved here. And so, yeah, I can imagine that, that, that it poses challenge on, in such a dynamic brand like McLaren. Yeah. And, and I mean, absolutely. But, but to your point, I mean, I think, you know, on average companies underestimate the importance of, of being a brand and some wouldn't even call themselves a brand. I mean, especially in retail, I, I think at least, you know, from a, from a, you know, German perspective, I would say the majority of retailers wouldn't look at themselves as a brand because they call themselves retailer and they sell other people's brands and, you know, brands is what they do. We do retail. And I think that's a, that's a huge misconception because at the end of the day, the brands that a retailer is selling is content, if you will. And of course they have their own brand image and, you know, and, and hopefully they have a strong halo, but if, if they delist you, if they decide to not sell to you anymore, what's left, if you are just a table at a location or a, a, an online shop with product lists that are all of a sudden empty, that's not good. So I would urge everybody to really understand that brand meaning and, and the power of meaning and relevance in consumer minds, that this is not just very healthy from, you know, an SEO organic traffic point of view, retention point of view, but it, it, it is literally, I think, the life insurance and, and, you know, the recipe for independence from ultimately, you know, single brands or single suppliers. It makes you independent from third parties. And that's no different to, to, you know, between a retailer and a brand. Retailers should think a lot more like brands do. Yeah. And, and McLaren was just, you know, fascinating to see. And, and I, you know, I remember, you know, walking through this, this building and I, I mean, it's, it's worth checking out on YouTube, McLaren Technology Center. I mean, a building, you know, designed by, by Sir Norman Foster. I mean, that whole experience of that so-called office 
which at the same time is the home base of the F1 team and later on also the, the in quotation marks, factory. I mean, it looks more like, I don't know, a surgery, I mean, like a hospital. But I mean, that the factory for the prestige road cars, the high-end sports cars that they started to, to build back then. I mean, to see this and, and, and the attitude that, that came with it and the way this was also important for the identification of the people, for the you know, self-esteem, I mean, it, it, it did so many things on so many levels. And then you, you enter a building, I don't know, over here, f f even from brands, and, and, you, and you just see the headquarters, and, and, and you just know it's not a brand. I mean, this is, show me the office, show me the way you put yourself together, you know, behind the curtain. And I, and I have a good sense of whether you are a brand or whether you're just faking a brand to the consumers. Yeah. Point, points well taken and, and particularly, yeah, you're right about, about retailers. A, a lot of them, they just don't have that interest. It's, it's hard, it's hard work building a brand. You're not going to see that immediate return. And I think a lot of retailers do get sucked into just these, these very immediate feedback loops that, that you see with performance marketing channels. And it, you know, to, it all comes back to that point of what you said, independence, because there you, you end up you know, there's the, the, yeah, how your relationship is with your vendors and the kind of situations you can find yourself in there because, you know, vendors are going to have expectations of you, what kind of volume you're doing, stuff like that. And this will affect your pricing and what's going to affect your margin and so on. But also on that channel side, there are retailers that have, that are 80% of their revenue is, de is dependent on performance marketing. And it's because they don't have a brand and they evaporate into nothing without, without that, that paid acquisition. And by the way, I'm somebody who works in paid acquisition, but I just think, I think we need to think sometimes a little, a little bigger than that. I mean, there's nothing wrong with paid acquisition. In fact, I mean, it's, it's inevitable that you need to pay to acquire new customers, but you need to understand that the value lies within the existing customers because you want, you know, a digression of marketing costs in consecutive orders. So, I mean, the first order, the, the acquisition order is what you pay for. And then ideally, you know, you, you create a long relationship and you foster, you know, purchasing behavior on the back of this initial acquisition that drives your margin and hence the lifetime and, you know, the contribution margin from that lifetime relationship that you have with the acquired customer. But that's the, the theory, and everybody will agree to this, but the reality tends to be a lot different because, as you say, just don't understand how to get this, you know, existing customer game to work. Neither do they have, I mean, most likely they neither have a clear data model nor the tools and the understanding what CRM actually is. They think one to many newsletters is CRM. I mean... It's a, I mean, newsletters are, are even a synonym for CRM in, in some of the companies, which is hilarious. But that's where, of course, a huge lever is with regards to profitability. I mean, you know, acquiring traffic through paid traffic for acquisition is, I would say, you, you should be, you know, minimizing this to the degree possible and, and, and just make sure that you, the cohorts you bring into the company are healthy and big enough to get that CRM flywheel in motion. It's, it's a form of art. And of course, organic traffic and, you know, purchase, reap rates, that all gets triggered and, and, and supported by great experiences, by relevancy, you know, by, by doing a good job towards your consumer. Acquisition is relatively easy. You just need a budget. But CRM is means you have to be able to deliver meaning and relevance. It's a lot harder but that's where I think success and, and failure ultimately is determined. Perfectly stated. And I'm going to use this as a slightly awkward transition to, well, because I, I'm curious on the back of everything you just said, there's a, there's a company that for better or worse has occupied a lot of attention lately, also from, from both of us. That company is Emu or Emu, as we uh, say in the German speaking area. But yeah, I mean, as we're recording this, the the Super Bowl just happened. And actually, I think we'll get a quick turnaround on this episode. But 
the Super Bowl just happened and and Timu had, I think, like five ads at the Super Bowl. They're spending estimates from Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan to first slightly, but they're probably spending on the order of three billion US dollars just in the US, not globally. And that's on, yeah, mostly meta ads, Google ads. And I'm just I'm just bewildered by this strange company. So maybe you could tell us what's going on with Timu. How do you see what's happening here? Yeah, in, indeed. I mean, at least within our bubble, and and I think more and more even outside our bubble, this is this is a hot topic. And it kind of started with Shein, and we, you know we we can discuss this uh, in a moment. But I mean, Shein is is another let's say Chinese originated playbook under the headline of consumer to manufacturer, if you will. I mean, that's kind of how how this started to to emerge, but. Uh, Timu is a Shanghai-based subsidiary of PDD. PDD is more known for their biggest asset, Pinduoduo, which is obviously a huge success, 30-ish billion in U.S. dollar revenue in, in China, 140 billion in you know market cap. I mean, it's a, it's a, yeah, a strong playbook. They outperform now in terms of market value, even Alibaba. So it's a, it's a serious parent company. And that parent company, PDD, kicked in or kicked off Timu as a non-Chinese offering. And they started in the U.S. in, in 2022 and, and then continued their expansion into Europe only in April of last year. So April 2023, they they went outside then the U.S. And ever since, I mean, this is this is a playbook that unfolds rapidly and all the numbers that you see, and you never know what's true. I mean, obviously everybody's estimating, and so I, I think everything that you that you read, you have to take it, you know, with a grain of salt. But generally speaking, I mean, three to five billion in advertising spend is is mind blowing. They they have a, an adoption. I think there was a data point. I, I think it even in your report, I'm not sure, but twenty percent of U.S. you know citizens placed an order only in September. Twenty percent. They just had a had a study. A couple of weeks ago in Germany, that 26% of all Germans have tried Timu over the last six months. They have traffic on the level of Walmart by now. So it's 500-ish million per month on, on, on traffic, hundreds of millions of, of or nearly 100 million of active app users, which is three-digit, four-digit growth. I mean, whatever you look at, it's like, Jesus, this is really, really crazy in terms of, I mean, imagine from from early 23 until today, you know, 25, 26% of, of adoption or at least one-time usage in, in a large, you know, market like, like Germany. They are number four already in the in the German marketplaces scene. So Amazon, eBay, Otto, and then number four is already Timu after such a short period of time. Huge investment in marketing. But not only that, I mean, obviously they do a lot of things slightly different to what, you know, the Amazons and, and the Ebays of the of this world did so far. Although the comparison isn't right, we'll talk about maybe Wish and, and other, you know, more comparable playbooks. But this is absolutely a player, Shein and Temu are at least two players that came along over the last one to two years Sheen slightly longer in the market, 2008 they launched, but both entered the stage big time, are fighting each other, throwing big buckets of, of advertising dollars around, but they also break patterns of retail as we knew it or e-commerce as we knew it, which is, of course, uh, something everybody should look at. Yeah, that's a that's a great overview and intro in, intro to to this company, and it's it it really is astonishing. I mean, because they it's like they just turned on a switch. You, you know, the brand didn't exist, if you can call it a brand. The company didn't exist, and like say what you will about about she and they like to remind people that they've been around for something like ten years, and then they got into this um, scaling mode and kind of redefining. Fast fashion, we can maybe talk about that in a minute again with this, as you mentioned, C to M model. But but team, yeah, okay, it's 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 on the back of of PDD, but but it's it's just mind blowing. It's a market entry like nothing I'm aware of in my in my limited knowledge of <laughs> of commercial history. I've never really seen or heard of something like this. It's because you know there's not like a zero to 
60 or zero to 100 kilometers per hour. It, it's more like a rocket. Like everyone says, oh, it's taking off like a rocket. This is really, it, it just, it's a vertical ascent. It's insane. Yeah, I mean the, I mean C2M is is more associated to Shein, and and I'll explain sure. in a moment what why that is. I mean Timu started as a marketplace from the get go, and different to Shein, who started with a focus on fashion. Timu out of the gate basically uh, started as a multi category playbook, not as yeah. broad as Amazon, but but relatively broad. So is yeah. is, is multi category play. I mean, and 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 the key success or one of the key success factors definitely is that i mean any any marketplace needs liquidity both on the demand and the supply and the supply side for so-called network effects to kick in and the network effect means uh, that from a user point of view or or that you know the 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 law of physics are the more usage there is the more Sorry, the more users there are, the more value usage gets. So that's kind of you know a self-multiplying mechanism that that if a network is successful, that is the underlying, let's say, law of physics that that is this that is applied. Now, how do you get this? This is the chicken and egg problem. So typically, a marketplace either has customers or suppliers, and if you lack one of the two, then it is difficult. Now, what they did is because of their huge presence in China through Pinduoduo, which, I mean, just to get, get a sense for scale, around 30 million active buyers they already had or have on the Pinduoduo side. So if you if you facilitate supply for 700, nearly 750 million active buyers in China, you do have the according supply base. Now, what they did is they entered that supply base or they leveraged part of that supply base for Timu. So from a network effect point of view, they had a head start by making sure that they already have a very vibrant and, and uh, liquid supply base. And through that, they started to give access to very small, small and medium-sized suppliers that Alibaba and, and the likes never catered for. So those SMB suppliers attracted through the Pinduoduo, let's say, momentum, they now got access to international business outside China as well. So, and the deal is you, you, you manufacturer, you, yeah, you seller, you sell to our consumers at wholesale value. So you basically provide the same, the same prices that normally a reseller would get. So you sell to end consumers at wholesale price, and Timu takes care of the whole logistics after the supplier did send it the first mile. So within China, they have a, a warehouse where they basically collect those orders from the factories, and then they do the whole logistics trick. You know, they combine volumes, they do the, the shipping into, you know, the various countries, by the way, they start to open logistics in countries like the U.S. and Europe and regions like Europe as well. Yeah, but that's, I think, a major trick and a huge difference to everybody else. Leveraging Pinduoduo supplier base, SMB suppliers, getting access to international buyers. The deal is you, you sell or sell at wholesale price, which makes the pricing super aggressive and attractive to end consumers in you know internationally and how does that work how, how how does the economics work well because timu takes care of the logistics after the first mile so they take over after the first stop and then they optimize everything else and that gives gives international buyers so people in the us people in europe consumers access to ridiculous pricing i mean if you check out the website the or the app i mean sometimes you think there must be an error so, I mean, this price level is half or a third of what even Chinese sellers on Amazon, you know, sell it for. And, and, and this is all possible because of what I, what I just explained. So this is at least, I think, one of the key levers that people tend to oversee. Yeah, I like that uh, comparison to kind of the physics of this, because I, I always think of marketplaces as kind of like a fusion reaction where, you know, you need a lot of, of heat and, and pressure 
to to generate that that fusion but then you know and this is critical mass once you've got that critical mass though ridiculous amount of energy is released and 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 it really is this kind of engineering challenge or physics challenge and you know they've got this kind of glowing hot core that they're taking out of china and just dropping it into this ocean of demand over here and 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 then they're they're just trying to concentrate that with all this advertising pressure to stimulate that demand it's it's just so fascinating i wasn't aware of this you know, you always hear about kind of like the last mile challenge or, or and, and people caring for the last mile in logistics. But that's quite interesting that, you know, there's this first mile thing and then they they follow all the way through. I just want I just want to call it a couple of, of observations that I find, again, fascinating about this company. Like, for one thing, a behavior that I think to me, it just somehow exemplifies what they're about. They've got these slower windows because they're shipping this stuff from. From China, that as you said, they're starting to build up some some local some local kind of capacity, but this stuff is basically coming from China. And I think a typical delivery is like I think they're talking about seven to fourteen days, basically. Yeah. But what we saw is that it, there was kind of an expectation. Okay, team was advertising like crazy, like crazy, like crazy, and we're coming up on Christmas. This was in, at the end of 2023. They've missed it. They've missed the holiday at a certain point because their shipping windows are too long and stuff's not going to arrive in Christmas anymore. And the rational thing to do, you you might think, would be reduce your investment. But they, because the conversion rates, they reportedly, or by estimates, already have very low conversion rates compared to a company like Amazon in these advertisements. But they... They just doubled down. They didn't slow down for a minute. Mm. I think, you know, the cost for them of slowing down or of changing anything, and it's just a different philosophy. They just kept spending. And and another thing that I find interesting, you know, there is nothing organic here. Organic is too slow. I, I mean, there's different kinds. It depends how you want to find organic. But if we're talking about like, for example, their presence in Google search, it's 100% paid basically. I can get this data from Google and we see that the ratio of their paid ads to their organic free ads, our, our placements, is it's greater than 100 to 1. It's a, So it's at least 100 to 1. We don't know what it is because the report maxes out there. And this is very different that you'll see, let's say Amazon, I have to look, but they're like 14 to 1, let's say. Auto might be at, I don't know, 10 to 1 or up to maybe 20 to 1. And then there's Timu out there on a limb with a hundred to one. And yet, you know, take, I'll bring out another German reference here to the German market, Zalando, absolutely massive retailer and marketplace specializing in fashion here in Europe. Their home market, their home field is Germany. And Timu has more visibility than them in Google and and it's none of it is organic. They, it, it's just it's just astounding what they're doing here. And I think it's exactly it's in service of just trying to it's his bet that they can make those physics work. I mean, it's obviously, I mean, it's it's land grab momentum, and and they I think scare the heck out of out of the even Amazons of this world already, mm-hmm. because I mean. We'll talk about you know how, how to also look at this. I mean, is there a risk? I, I would say, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. is this a proven winner? I would say no. But but at the moment, who cares? I mean, <laughs> they, at least they change dynamics, they change the marketplace, they change consumer perception and behavior, and they eat revenue away from others. And you know, consumers don't care whether you're making a profit on an order or not. They place the order with you and not with Amazon or not with with Zalando. I mean, it's like. Definitely they are. And they're even eating into C2C. You know, you know, people, why should I buy used stuff if I get the new stuff mm-hmm. for even, you know, a few lower prices straight yeah. from anyway. So there's a lot of collateral damage or effects, if you will, on all kind of players and, and models. But of course, you're right. I mean, if if they cannot show repeat orders and unit economics to work. This will be a very expensive exercise, and of course, you would assume at some point even PDDs, uh, you know, funds would start to dry out if that wouldn't change. For now, they don't care, and apparently, the, the, I I think there is also there are pockets of profitability already. I mean, you never know what's true or what's not. 
but they seem to manage the average order value quite nicely because, and we should talk about some of the UX stuff as well, the gamification piece, but apparently they they are able to to drive up number of pieces per order that they compensate for the low average selling price through pieces per order. Hence, the average order value is actually quite healthy for a business with, with such low prices. And because it's so cheap, people tend to not return. And it's like, okay, who cares? Yeah, I mean, $3 for a T-shirt. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm not going to the post office to return this. In fact, they may even ask you to throw it away instead of sending it back anyway. But so hardly any returns, uh, relatively high average order values because they pump up the pieces per order. And apparently they even managed to get, you know, existing customers to come back more often. I don't know if this holds true, but there is a data point from sep September to in comparison to October 23 and the, the relation of daily active users to monthly active users apparently improved from 9 to 20%. That's okay. a massive improvement on recurring activity. Now, if that was true, it would show that people actually appreciated the experience more than you and I may think. And if that was true, it would also indicate that there is a potential unit economics playbook starting to unfold. I'm skeptical. I'm totally honest. I'm skeptical because bad buyer experience is, at the end of the day, where this all may fall short. Because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how cheap it is. If it is, mm -hmm. you know, if it creates skin allergy, if, it, if the battery pack explodes, if stuff is just awful, wrong, defect, whatever... The bad buyer experience kills any, any model, and no matter how cheap it is. Mm -hmm. But that's still not, I mean, it's not clear whether it's actually true what I'm saying. It could well be that the bad buyer experience is, is something that they get under control, that it is, in fact, not a problem. And then this would start to move into a unit economics friendly model. Just imagine that would happen, dear Amazon. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I mean, and I think I think Amazon, they've kind of set this up to be possible because I think Timu would be utterly rejected by Western markets. I don't know. I'm just going to say five years ago, that that share of of Chinese sellers on Amazon has gotten higher and higher and higher. What is it, sixty percent or something? So it's already it's already a Chinese seller dominated platform as well. Yeah. Yeah, abs absolutely. And I think people have just they've gotten familiar with the quality. They've they've just wrapped their heads around this. They've kind of made peace with it. Um, and you, you know now it's more possible for something like Timo to occur. And it, and it's sort of an opposite playbook that Timo is running to Amazon because you know Amazon at least historically they started out with Western sellers, and then they gradually brought on more and more Chinese sellers into the marketplace. It's a little different when they launch in countries here in Europe that those Chinese sellers are already there, and often they'll kind of seed with a lot of Chinese sellers. Um, these these new European are relatively new, like um, Netherlands, for example, or, or Sweden. That's how it played out there. But but at, at point being, it's sort of opposite with Pimu. They started with 100% Chinese sellers, and now they're looking at onboarding Western sellers. And I think that this, I, I, I'm, more, I'm wondering if you think that Western sellers will take up this offer, but I think this could be really important to to the next phase of that of that market. Yeah, I mean, I think the the interesting piece here is, and I, I said it in in a few articles already two or three years ago. The problem with existing marketplaces, at least over here, is most of them started as retailers. I mean, eBay is the only exception, but Amazon, Otto, Zalando, About You, they all started as be, as retailers. And then they added a marketplaces component to their model for, for obvious reasons. And that started to scale nicely, and it has, I mean, a larger share for some of those players already than their own retail business. Having said that, it's still those are still companies that are in essence very retail and hence consumer focused. Now, Timu, for example, came along from from the opposite uh, direction. So they are a let's say seller and supply uh, centered playbook. 
by giving SMB suppliers access to international audiences, by making sure that they have the same income as before when they did wholesale, and then any discount activity that Timu puts on top of it is at the at the expense of Timu. So the so the seller doesn't even need to worry about squeezing further profits by by through discount actions and and promotions and sort of thing. So I mean, this is if you think about it, this is a very I wouldn't call it. It's not seller friendly. I mean, they're not. Mm-hmm. You know, then that at the end they may not care at all. But it's it's still a seller, a more seller centric approach because they start to look at supply and 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 what sellers do I need to actually develop a proposition for consumers that is absolutely killing it. And mm-hmm. this is what they achieve by thinking differently. And looking at this through the eyes of supply, logistics, and the seller base to present an offering to consumers that is that that has been so far not 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 met by anyone. And Amazon sells the same products for twice the price because of the way that they integrate those sellers. It's a completely different relationship that Timu started to to build out. And I'm very curious to what extent a European or Western let's say manufacturers slash sellers, to what extent they, they will adopt. At the end of the day, if you look at it through their eyes, if you get the same buck than before, so you get your normal wholesale margin, and then you ship it to a warehouse near you, and then everything else is taken care of by Timu, and any discount that they give is at their expense, and you had you you did your margin, and you get high volume and good payment terms, what's not to like about it? Yeah, it's, that's a, it's a good point. I'm wondering, um, and it's also about, yeah, that Timu really is this pure marketplace. It's true. Those are, are rather rare. And I, but I'm, I'm wondering if we'll see like, you know, there's Amazon basics. If you're searching for batteries or a USB cable or something, you'll see the Amazon basics and then there are other brands. But I'm just wondering if we're going to see Timu basics rolling out one time. Let's see. I think the temptation must be there. But I don't want to just talk about Timu. Let's talk about Shein a bit too. Uh, hold on. I've got one real quick question. Why didn't this work for AliExpress? Because Ali, Alibaba, I see, I see this as similar. Ali, Alibaba is this massively successful Chinese e-commerce company. They tried to localize into some Western markets, and they never took off. Is it, is it just a matter of budget, or why wouldn't this work for AliExpress or Wish? They all look the same, but are very different. I would say the most comparable maybe is AliExpress, but even they are very different, especially with regards to that supplier base. So that playbook as I explained, of going into SMB, hence have very aggressive pricing and then give those people access to volume and end consumers with no logistical hassle. That's nothing AliExpress is, at least at the moment, capable of doing. Neither ever did they. So it's a more, let's say, professionalized you know, SMB, uh, sorry, larger enterprise kind of uh, supplier playbook that they have with different cost structure behind it. So I think there is a there is a difference in that, let's say, logistics supply uh, playbook. When you look at Wish, they never had any integration. I mean, that was basically a curation on top of AliExpress, if you will. I mean, those were smart guys from, from the US. They weren't even in China. And they just tried to curate basically, you know, Chinese listings that are that were already available, if I mean to an oh. extent. Is more or less a drop shipping company is that yeah. what so I think that wasn't integrated into the logistics and and the supply base at all AliExpress is so or you know Alibaba but with a different cost structure and a different let's say yeah model behind this and I think if you couple the the supply and logistics approach that I explained and couple that with you know a deep and aggressive investment strategy in terms of you know buying market share being very Pre- overly present, I think the combination of those two make a big difference. Whether bad buyer experience, which is partially, I think, what what Wish and partially also AliExpress suffer from, you know, whether bad buyer experience will be in in Temu's way, or whether they will solve this quicker and more effectively, is to be seen. Apparently. I even read an article that the quality that we see on Temu is so bad that they wouldn't even sell this in China, which is funny that we've reached a point that China produces rubbish 
especially for the Western markets, because that's what what they seem to appreciate. Now, if that was true, and you never know, as I said, I mean, it could be a funny anecdote somebody made up. But if I mean, if that was true, even then you can imagine how easy it is for Timu to change quality levels and say, listen, you don't need to eat this stuff. <laughs> we can serve you better quality. And and I would not underestimate the ability of those companies to understand what's needed. And if there is a business case to to scale up quality or reduce, you know, delivery lead times, whatever, you know, moves the needle, I would be very uh, conscious or I, I would make a bet that they are able to pull this off. I mean, for decades, we in, in the, over here have, have been laughing about Chinese cars. And by now, they, the, you know, electronic vehicles from China outperform even on the Western markets to some extent, even the Western brands. So, I, I mean, it, it may take a bit, but I think they have, you know, the, the mindset and, and, you know, the financing behind this to, to see this through and, and deliver changes that are needed. Well, thank you. Thank you for those notes. That really clarified that a bit for me. So I appreciate it. Now let's talk about another business model. And I know I don't want to keep you too long. So, but <laughs> let's talk about Shein because there's a lot of, I would say, false equivalency between these two. Like they're often kind of considered like twin siblings or something and and kind of <laughs> fighting each other. There's the lawsuits and so on. And it, it makes for good headlines. But let's get back because everyone knows D to C and and people know consumer to consumer marketplaces. But so what is consumer to manufacturer? Because I know it's nothing new to you, but I think a lot of people don't know that much about the business model. How does Shein work? Yeah. So Shein is, if you will, a H&M on steroids or a Zara on steroids. So what they what they did is they've taken the idea of a fully vertically integrated approach, which means I am the brand, I own factories, and I produce my own goods to get the full margin. And then basically through a direct-to-consumer model, ship it directly and sell it directly to, to my consumers. They've taken this model the next step. They don't own factories. What they did is they built up an, uh, a huge network of uh, factories, which are directly integrated into Shein's ERP systems in, in the, into their back end. And what happens is Shein, through, amongst other things, but also leveraging AI, Shein understands demand in, in the market. So they, they listen to social, they try to understand signals that they see in social media, in their own app, on their own products. They try to get those signals in with regards to what's hot designs, colors, shapes, forms, whatever it may be. And then they take those signals and they create products to serve those signals within a few working days. So by cutting out the the time needed to turn a demand signal into a product, to cut this down by, by cutting it down to three to five working days, imagine three to five working days from signal to a product that's going up onto their app to be sold in small batches, yeah, to just to test the water, but still a couple of working days to, to, to get it live. And once this shows success, they reorder larger volumes. But by, by changing that approach and listening to consumers and feeding the consumer signal directly into the manufacturers, which they don't own, but they interface with and manage very closely. This is called consumer to manufacturer because the consumer sends the signal via Shein's platform straight into the manufacturer's sites. They can bid to, to basically take the production so they can apply to now build the product and, and, and then ship it as well. And this leads to you know quick turnover times to rapid updates Three, five, six thousand new items per day hit the platform, and they all, if things go according to the plan, they all are closer to to any demand out there than Zara or H and M could possibly do it. I mean, Zara is great already in copying demands and being being quick, but they have a huge retail base. So 
already through the 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 level of physical retail involved, they have a competitive disadvantage because it takes a lot longer to get it shipped into stores and so forth. While Shein is already alive and kicking uh, on their digital, di di you know, points of sale, especially their app. That's a huge, huge shift. And 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 basically, the the, the next level after uh, D to C, this is C to M. Yeah, thanks for that uh, very lucid explanation. And yeah, I mean, I've I've heard numbers as high as ten thousand new items a day. Yeah, yeah I, think... I mean, the numbers fluctuate three, five, six, but maybe ten by now. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 pretty mind blowing. And by the way, yeah. the other end of sustainability on the <laughs> sustainability scale, but that's a different subject. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, and worth mentioning, I, yeah, the textiles, textiles, I think are like something like 10% of, of carbon, of the carbon footprint, yeah. the global carbon footprint, but it's, it's just stunning. The experience as a, as a consumer, as a user, it is kind of intoxicating this endless variety and, and you do need to act fast. There's a lot of FOMO too, because there's, I think people don't necessarily realize that there's this algorithm behind the scenes and maybe it'll get reordered in a larger batch of nuts. But people will have the experience of putting something in their cart. They waited too long. It's sold out and it's never coming back. So I think it also, it encourages impulse buys. And unlike Timu, which is just, yeah, there is word of mouth effect to a certain extent with Timu. But Shein has achieved this genuine kind of virality in social. And maybe there's probably, I'm sure, paid influencers out there as well. But they have gotten this really effective word of mouth presence built up and you'll see that you know users are uploading a lot of their own photos and very detailed reviews and stuff like that and it's just this very engaged kind of of user base it strikes me so yeah I think absolutely yeah yeah i mean the in the she in hashtag sheen hall for example gets i mean literally billions in reach and they have tens of thousands of micro influences that they work with and they get a commission for new customers only, which is quite smart. So it's not a it's not a commission on any sale on every sale. It's it's for new customers only, which means yeah. the natural you know momentum to to not pay for any further orders, but to get them hooked up into the app, download app, start to order, and then that's a commission and only once. So the micro influencers get huge reach because those hashtags are so successful, and then they then they get a commission on new customers. And of course, they get you know goods free of charge, which obviously they love. Young people, you know, love that. So this is this is a nice, you know, it's not overly complicated, but it's a nice flywheel that they manage to to not only impl implement but also scale, big big time. I mean, they are, I think, still the number one brand on on most social outlets. So they outperform even you know, well-known brands like Gucci or Prada or whatever. I mean, they outperform most all Nike. I mean, they outperform them all in terms of, you know, virality, uh, virality and, uh, you know, uh, you know, the hashtags being used. This is, this is pretty, pretty impressive. And just a last sentence on that UX piece, the user experience of both Shein and, and Temu is irritating to at least the Western eye, but don't be fooled. This is not just you know a cultural clash you know there is more to it so one one phenomenon is that the the, the user experience is, is slightly overloading uh, so your brain is super busy I means constantly something pops up there is a you know uh, a game you know it's something you need to move and 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 click and 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 you get you know micro re rewards with every other click and you know free this do this so there's a there is a cognitive overload which 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 there is a this research was was published a couple of weeks ago on this so that that cognitive overload removes your negative emotions that you may have so it rem you're so busy <laughs> you can't even reflect how much you you may dislike it that's number 1 and then because of all those small you know benefits and and you know gifts that you're getting the second phenomenon is that they pretty early on in the process triggered dopamine, you know, and this means that you start to become trigger happy. You want to place that order. So it's a psychological trick, if you will. And it looks, yes, yeah, I mean, it looks very obvious when you, you know, when you, when you browse the app or, or the, sh the, the, the shop, but it is, it is by design making you 
feel delighted, making you, you know, want to place an order. That's why the average baskets are so high because you, you add five more products than you rationally would have had, but you're completely on dopamine, which is that hormone that, you know, is, is the one that kicks in when we feel good, when we feel lucky, when we, you know, when we're trying to reward ourselves. And that's, those are two, two mechanisms, remove bad feelings, kick in dopamine, you know, to make you place orders very, very early on. These are two very different things to was, to Western e-commerce. We do search engine optimization and conversion optimization. I mean, that's what we do all day. And then in the shop, we try to make sure that you don't lose, we're not losing you out of the funnel. So it's a conversion optimization that we grew up with. They think about this very differently. They seek dopamine they seek reward they seek basically engagement and through that they drive uh, more cons consumption than you rationally would have had placed is that a good thing different debate but it's at least a phenomenon to be aware of yeah i think i, I mean just these technologies really they mentioned like the this this kind of algorithmic selection and and that that very direct integration just it's mind blowing opening up your ERP directly to a network of manufacturers it's because let's pick on Zalando again very advanced and very dominant fashion marketplace in in Europe and you know I know I've looked at their they've got a really huge data science team and they work really hard on on pricing and recommendation engine and all kinds of of important topics they're a data driven company but there's something there's some other characteristic i work with a company like she and i just feel like these are incredibly modern companies they're futuristic companies in in some ways and we might not like it also these dopamine loops that you've mentioned you know, everyone saw the, the social dilemma. We learned about dopamine loops latest then. Uh, but to then, that's not just social media. This stuff is just being built in everywhere. And it's almost like biologically hacking someone because this, this appeals to deep-seated uh, biases and ancient mechanisms in our brain and our bodies. True. And True. I mean, yeah, it's it's almost there's a level where it's not resistible. So it's just and, and that's stuff. Yeah, and that's why why I I tend to remind everyone. I mean, over here in Germany, you know, things are always on on the darker side, and the glass glass is half empty, and we like to to moan and complain. And the 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 first reaction in the marketplace over here, at least, was to complain. This isn't right. They shouldn't be doing this, and this is awful. And look at this, and and the taxes, and the postal fees, and you know. And of course, don't get me wrong, there is a long list of things we, we have to discuss and also criticize with those players. By the way, not only with Timu and Shein. I mean, there is a lot to be criticized in a lot of companies around fashion, especially. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going wrong. The point is, as much as I appreciate criticism, and, and I don't want to be seen as someone that doesn't reflect critically on this, we have to. But at the same time, don't fail to identify important learnings, innovation that is transferable into a better context. So I, I, I would I would spend most of my energy not on the complaining piece, but in in fact, on so what is in there that I can learn from, I can I can take and apply it in a in a more, I don't know, economically or environmentally sensible fashion. Do something good with the innovation that you can see. Don't stop at the level of complaining and pointing fingers at a new competitor. Learn from it and innovate and think of how can you differentiate towards what they do because you will lose on price. Just get used to the feeling that they will dominate that entry price level on most categories. Just get used to that idea. Maybe I'm wrong and they won't, great. But if they do, what then? And you shouldn't, you should not be surprised by this question in, in, in a year or two from now. You should start thinking about if in a scenario that that could be true. So what's your differentiating innovation against companies that, that will outperform you on price, whatever you do? That's how I would look at this, yeah. Well, that, you know, I, I want to ask you a final lightning round question. Imagine you're still at like Otto or eBay or Tom Taylor. And and how would you think about, about these companies today? But I think you just brilliantly answered yeah. that. And 
I think it's a great note to end on. I've also kept you too long. So I want to thank you for sharing your time, your intelligence, your experience with us. I really appreciate it. So before I let you go, where can we find you? Anything, any projects you want to plug? Anything you want to shout out? Well, I mean, I have a couple of things, uh, you know, going on in parallel. So I, I support a company called On Quality. So that's a leading integrator for brands that try to succeed on marketplaces as software and services. And I'm co-CEO of that company that keeps me busy for a good part of, of the day. And anybody who wants, as a brand, who wants to scale Europe, Europe-wide, 20 markets, 100 platforms, anybody who wants to enter that complex world and needs support, of course, feel free to reach out. But besides that, I'm also as a, you know, busy as a consultant and advisor to, to founders and C-level executives navigating basically commerce strategies, go to markets. That's something... Uh, I'm always, uh, you know, willing to to be, uh, you know, sparing people, helping, you know, to to make sense of strategies moving forward. And last but not least, I'm a I'm a keynote speaker and a podcast host. So anybody fancying, uh, you know, to book me as a speaker on the next event, it's not just D 2 C or C to M. You know, it's it's all things digital. What goes on in the space is also, you know, appreciate. Basically, anybody who wants to discuss a topic. LinkedIn is is our friend. Reach out. Delighted to continue conversations. Yeah, well, I think for everyone listening, it's it's abundantly clear ju- just the depth of experience and insight that you bring. Great, great person to have on your team as a you know great great ally to have as a consultant or in any regard as a keynote speaker. I've loved speaking with you. Thank you again, and we'll see you around on on LinkedIn and elsewhere. Thanks, Mike. Have a good day. Thanks for listening to Growing E-commerce, and if you enjoyed this podcast please consider sharing it with coworkers, friends, or within your professional network. We really appreciate it. This podcast is produced by Smarter E-Commerce, also known as Mech. To learn more, visit smarter-ecommerce.com.